economy and everything that we've been tracking, we want to bring in John Grace, who's the founder and president of Investors Advantage Corp. John, it is always a pleasure to speak with you, sir, um, and we appreciate the time repeatedly. Let's start things off here, if we may. Stocks fell following Jerome Powell's press conference this afternoon. Uh, what do you pinpoint as the primary reason? Well, I'm sure there are several, Brad and Nora, and it may be something akin to one of my favorite cartoons. Remember Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner would of run off the surface and hang there for just a couple of seconds and then find out how low we can go. We may have peaked on Monday. I mean, we've got uh, some real serious headwinds ahead of us, and I think the, the market has gotten ahead of itself, uh, and I'm worried about how it will turn. I think it'll get very nasty very soon. Wow. So how soon do you believe that that could happen? Well, Brad, I, I, I try to say to folks, it's never about the prediction. It's always about the preparation. Everybody wants to know the date and the time. And when you can't craft the date and the time correctly, then they say you're an idiot. So, you know, when's the next earthquake? When's the next hurricane? I don't know that answer. I don't think anybody does. But if you're ready, it really doesn't matter. So what I'm saying is the, the, the real cracks that I see that you're not hearing about in the news anywhere has to do with the trade war that is right you know, under the surface here. And then I, not only the pandemic second wave in terms of COVID, but what about the uh, second wave of bankruptcies for major companies? Uh, J. Crew, Hertz, okay, Neiman Marcus, just to name a few. Uh, we haven't seen that yet. So uh, right now I think we get, we get, we're getting high on the hopium again. And as long as things keep going up, everything's fine. But there are absolutely uh, clouds on the horizon, and I would submit cracks in the foundation. Look, I mean, these markets certainly do have high hopes, uh, high apple pie in the sky hopes. Right now, we're looking at Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Tesla, all closing at record highs. And so when you think about the tech names that we've watched, some of the components in the NASDAQ, those that make up the FANG names that have excelled during the pandemic, do investors now start to overweight themselves in those areas? And how do they kind of steer clear of any pullback or retracement that we might see if there is some profit taking in the future? Great question. The way I like to put it is the first thing investors should do before they put the money on the line anywhere. I mean, let's just recognize we've seen, what, a 40 percent gain to the upside since March 23rd. And yet the Dow and the S&P are still in negative territory for the year. How is that possible? Um, and then only NASDAQ is up, I think, uh, year to date is about 12 percent. But let's also recognize, let's learn from history, Brad. It wasn't that long ago, it was in the Great Depression one, that for a period of time, and from what I can see, it was only the Dow at that time, right? Up 50 percent for six months hmm. on the way to an 80 percent decline. Could that be happening again right here before our very eyes? We'll see. But the first question I want investors to ask and answer is what kind of loss can you accept in a given year? or let's say six months. Is it 20% in a year? Is it 40% in a year? Craft that message first and then look to see where you can position funds, where they become more defensive as things become unglued. In other words, where we move out of shares into cash. So for 2008, these are real numbers. Being off 20% is certainly a lot better than the market being off 37%. Some funds are off 42%. So if we limit our losses to no more than 20, we only need 25% in 2009, which we got. Uh, on the upside, limit the losses so you can stay in the game as opposed to try that Hail Mary pass. A few lines that came from Fed Chair Jerome Powell today, John. Fed Chair Jerome Powell saying that he thinks the FOMC monetary policy is currently well positioned, also saying the extent of the downturn remains extraordinarily uncertain depending on the virus containment. And also saying, just lastly, I'll note here, the Fed will continue it to use its powers forcefully, proactively, aggressively. Those are three very strong words coming from the Fed that man maintained interest rates uh, and that they will likely stay near zero through at least 2022 amid the coronavirus crisis, perhaps, and, and hopefully COVID-19 does not last through 2022. However, as you're looking at how the Fed certainly is trying to build the economy back up, what do you make of the relentless approach from the Fed in combination with the Treasury? And then you throw into the equation as well what could come from Congress in terms of additional spending bills. Well, I mean, the Fed, central banks around the world, first of all, want you to believe they are omnipotent. They also want you to believe that they have the capacity to set the equivalent of a thermostat on the economic warm 
wall and the thermostat they desire to just control the temperature. So everybody's Humpty Dumpty is happy days are here again. It, the machines do the work for cooling the economy or warming the economy to your satisfaction. We've got this. But remember, he has a job to do. And the last thing he wants to have happen is watch the economy crumble on his watch. So it may be that the Fed is throwing everything, including every kitchen sink they can possibly find, but it may be the equivalent of showing up with a water pistol before a super soaker thunderstorm and it's game over. Let's recognize that the, the, the economy is not a machine. It runs as the way people live and die. And, and it's like winter. It happens. Winter turns cold. Sometimes it gets uncomfortable. Some things and some people die in the winter. But it's also true that some things and some people get stronger in the winter. And let's remember, spring always follows winter. But when the chairman is using words like, you know, weighing heavily on economic activity and considerable risks to the economic outlook, if that's not a clear indication that he's hinting at what he sees around the corner, but not, uh, d you know, divulging at this particular time, we better wake up and smell the coffee because, as I say, I think it's going to get ugly. Uh, just lastly here, it would be wrong if we didn't address uh, COVID-19 further and particularly the role of vaccines and that, that those announcements. Uh, what the role has been uh, amid the march up that we've seen over the past several weeks. Um, anytime we see a company announce that they've got a treatment, that they've got positive results, early results, uh, however they may be from a test and data emerges, we see them rise. Eli Lilly shares at a session high of $152.40 after Reuters reported uh, that COVID-19 treatments could be authorized for use as soon as September. So w when we think about all of this, and including today's session, how much of a role does further vaccine development play in the market's confidence? Well, it's huge, but let's recognize everyone who gives this forecast in terms of the timing, right? I, I'm saying, you know, uh, it's, it's futile to forecast, but when they give this forecast about when these vaccines might come about, it's under the most optimistic conditions we have never seen. We have never seen vaccines approved that work this quickly as they're suggesting that these vaccines will come online. So we're again, we're, we're getting high on the hopium. You know, we're, we're smelling these, uh, you know, sniffing these green leaves, thinking this is uh, back to normal and, and we'll see. But uh, I, we haven't seen anything happen as quickly as they're suggesting this will occur. I doubt, I have no reason to believe this will be as quickly as, as they're selling at this point in time. And I just want to correct myself, not an all-time high, just a session high after that announcement came out. John Grace, we certainly appreciate you, as always, founder and president of Investors Advantage Corp.